We really do need to have you guys <laughs> regularly. This is great. We're talking about forgiveness, and not just any forgiveness, not the let bygones be bygones, the forgiveness at least I grew up with. We're talking about radical forgiveness using Colin Tipping's book by the same name. We're exploring the fact that whenever anything gets under our skin, something that traditionally we would say that we need to forgive something or someone for, even to forgive God for, that it is a wonderful opportunity for us to do that deep dive and see what exactly is going on inside of us so that we can simply be free of it. That that issue is pushing against something that is tender, something that hurts inside of us, something we don't want to be reminded of. And we can just take that deep breath and say, okay, I'm the one reacting here. What's going on? These particular chapters, by the way, we're skipping, if you're reading along with us, we're skipping chapter five, and this week we're looking at chapters six, seven, and eight. These, in my opinion, are more technical chapters where Colin jumps into how is it that our ego forms? What happens in our psyche as we are children and developing and needing some kind of mechanism to help us to cope with the intensity of life sometimes? And he does a beautiful job of bringing in several different elements. I don't want this to be a lecture per se, so as I often do, I want to jump into an example and see if, if we can't work with it a little bit today. So here's what happened to me this week. I got a call from a friend, a call that I actually really appreciated, letting me know that another friend of mine was upset with me, angry with me. And this is what I find interesting. Uh, and right after the call, I put a call into my friend. Now, he didn't pick up. And in fact, he didn't pick up for, uh, well, he never picked up. <laughs> I called him again the next day. But do you know how that is? So I've, I have a lot of experience in things like nonviolent communication, in crucial conversations, in, in any number of things that we have studied that repeatedly have shown me when we are willing to connect with someone who is frustrated with us, angry, who we are angry with, that that face-to-face -face contact handled with a level of maturity generates a real connection again that that which is in the way can be freed and moved on. And yet in that time frame, with all the experience I have repeatedly, with all I know, you know, as more of the adult, my ego chattered on during that time, you know, saying things like, I can't believe he's angry at me. We decided this as a group of friends that we're going to do it. I'm sorry that he's not happy with the way that it went. Uh, yeah, it's just pretty much constant chatter. And it reminds me, the beauty of our spirituality is that we're practicing and that it's not a point of judging ourselves as to whether our ego goes away. I mean, I don't know about you. I'm fully expecting to die with an ego, <laughs> but I'm... I'm not so tied in. You know, there's a part of me that knows, yeah, I'm going to have this conversation. Yeah, uh, everything will be better after this conversation. And there's the ego doing the ego's thing. And so a big part of our spirituality is not getting caught. I love what Colin has to say. I think he describes the... Um, intensity of the ego well. Although all belief systems quickly become resistant to change, the ego is no ordinary belief system in this regard. It is extremely resistant. It holds incredible power in our unconscious mind and carries an enormous block of votes when it comes to making decisions about who we think we are or, I'm going to add here, how we think we need to defend ourselves. 
This belief system is so very powerful that it appears to be an entity in its own right, and we have called it the ego. So don't beat yourself up if you think you've done all sorts of work and yet still the ego exerts itself. It's going to exert itself. The key is, are you tied into it, right? So here's what I also found interesting. The call the next day, I called the next morning, got to have a great conversation with my friend. Uh, turns out my friend was very angry and uh, went through a whole host of things that I've done over the last many years, it turns out. <laughs> And, you know, on, again, on the one hand, while it was happening, I, w I felt such joy for my friend that he was getting this off his chest, as we say, you know, off our chest. But then after I hung up, I realized that I had some frustrations with some of the things that were said in the call. I felt frustrated at being accused of being what I heard as being self-centered and being selfish. And, you know, I found myself at any time I'd reflect on it going, that's not me. You know, I'm not that way. That seems unfair. <laughs> Ever find yourself saying things like that? And, you know, what's interesting is I wasn't getting it. Because this very week, one of the things that Colin Tipping focuses on is projection. And the way I understand projection, and I understand this could be a very simplified uh, uh, description, let's say, but I always think of projection as we were all raised in culture and different cultures. Like we were raised in a culture of our family, we were raised in the culture of maybe our religion or the culture of a spiritual community, we're raised in the general culture. And all of those cultures, whether they intend to or not, they define behaviors, thoughts, activities as good or bad. And most of us want to be identified with those things that are good. And if there is particularly something that we feel is not accepted or that we've been shamed about, then we tend to unconsciously put that away. That's not me. And we easily can project it onto someone else if we see them doing their behavior. Basically what we're saying is they're bad. <laughs> and uh, Colin says, you know, that a good indication of this is when we feel angry and judgmental, that with the judgment of projection always comes anger, he says. So let me just see. I have all these quotes today that I feel somewhat attached to, and I might as well see what they say. Oh, okay, good. We're still on tack. One of the things he said here, and Bonnie, you can bring this up. When we see ourselves as victims, we think only about killing the messenger. <laughs> we miss the message. And so you see, already, if, if I was fully identified with my ego in that point, I'd already be really wanting to kill my friend who brought up all these things that he was angry at me. But isn't it interesting, this one about, that's not me. I'm not selfish. I am not self-centered. Really got me. So, I'm sitting in bed, and I'm really not getting it. You know, I'm in the, it's in the morning time, and morning is a, uh, I'm up early. It's an easy time both for me to be clear, but it's also a time when my ego can really chew on me. And it's back into this, how dare he, blah, blah, blah. And Collins says something really beautiful. He says, it's through the gentle whispers of the higher self that we wake up bit by bit until we finally remember who we are. And it was really astounding to me. It's while my ego is yattering on, my ego doesn't fill space like it used to. You know, the prayer and meditation that I do, the work that I've done to take as many deep dives as I can into what's going on has also left more of a sense of quiet in my mind, in my consciousness. 
And in the, one of those moments of quiet between the ego, you know, demonizing my friend, I heard a simple word whispered, projection. Now, isn't it funny? I've been immersed in these three chapters for the entire week. I think I read them last Sunday after Sue's talk, and yet I did not recognize that projection was probably going on. And we, we have to be aware of that. That's why we engage and we practice spiritually. You're going to read these chapters and you go, isn't that nice? And oh yeah, maybe I've done that a few times. Or wow, I can really catch myself at doing that in the future. And then it's going to hit and be prepared. You're not going to recognize it. And it's why we open to the guidance too and why we are in a spiritual community where when we go to a friend, they might say, do you remember what Colin Tipping wrote in his book? Could this be projection? <laughs> you seem to be, you know, frustrated and judgmental. As I started to explore the idea of projection, I could feel the hint of how in our family, um, what would you say, giving to others was highly valued. I really felt like my mother's whole life was around giving to others, making sure that others' needs are met, making sure that we're attuned to them. I was fortunate that that very morning, just a couple of hours later, I got to go through the RAIN process with a friend of mine. I've told you that's one of my spiritual practices every week. And in that process, I got to move deeper into this culture in my family about being nice and these defenses that we form. You know, I shouldn't say being nice, being generous. The defense, like I started looking at what are the behaviors, what are the defenses that I adopted to make sure that I looked like I was generous and that I uh, was not self-centered, you know? So I learned to be nice. <laughs> I learned to be engaged with people. I learned to really pay attention to what they said so that I could be attuned to them. These are all ways that our uh, unconscious projections cause us to take on behaviors where we can convince ourselves, no, no, that's not me. But my friend, uh, we always do our RAIN process and then we have five minutes, five or 10 minutes of feedback. And in the feedback, she said, isn't this interesting? You know, in that first house that you were under contract for in Grand Lake, where our new home is, you really struggled when the costs of that house became higher, the, the repair costs became high. And I heard you repeatedly say, I don't feel comfortable spending this kind of money on myself. And you know, we can sit and we can say, so what if there's some parts of us they're not willing to accept? You know, so what if we project them onto other people? Well, the reality is that whenever there's something that we are not willing to accept, we start maneuvering around it in our lives. You know, suddenly we wouldn't want to do anything that would even reveal to ourselves, that would even make the unconscious conscious that actually there's a part of us that wants to have what it wants to have and maybe deserves to have what it wants to have. I mean, the whole experience uh, that I've had in our uh, new town of Grand Lake is this is really somewhere that my soul is supposed to be for a while. I don't know how long, but it has been so nurturing. And yet my belief system deeply ingrained that it's not okay to want something for myself. And actually it was a defense. You know, we had issues around spending money in my family that it became easier to just be about the other than to feel my own desires. But you can see how it begins then to block the nudging of spirit in us. And it 
can stop us in one way or another from having the things that we want or from stepping out in ways that are bigger than we think we are because we can't be this or we can't be that or we have to do it right. There's all these projections that go on. Let me see what the next quote is just to stay on track. Oh, we're doing great. So then it unfolded even further. Now you see I'm starting to get curious about, okay, where am I judgmental? Where does this, you know, anger come up? And, and, you know, I was thinking when I read the chapter, and I actually said, if you can imagine, <laughs> after hearing even what you've heard so far this talk, I thought, well, I don't really get that angry at people so much anymore. And I do, I definitely do have some judgments, but, you know, I don't, I wonder, have I worked through my projections? <laughs> yeah, just wipe that out of your consciousness right now. We're all projectors, right? Until uh, we reach that point of ultimate enlightenment. And then the minute you think you're enlightened, you might be projecting. So, you know, <laughs> give it up. So I'm, you know, now oriented towards it. And uh, I'm talking to a friend of mine on the telephone who lives out of state. And he's telling me about a friend of his who has just struck it rich during COVID. He evidently owns a company that, I don't know, I, I can't remember if the guy made disinfectants or cleaning supplies or whatever, but all of a sudden his product is in huge demand and he's made a small fortune since March. And he was, the friend was just telling me, yeah, you just went out and he, this is an older guy, it's just he and his wife. And they went out and bought an 8,000 square foot home and I immediately could feel my judgment come up you know I have I have judgment that one really you're for the two of you you're going to spend that much money for the two of you you're going to use up that much resources <laughs> to cool or heat an 8,000 square foot home and I was like and I was frustrated with them I don't even know this person. And I went, aha, <laughs> I'm projecting. What am I projecting now? And what I got to see was it wasn't not only, not only did we have to be selfless, you know, or did, we had to put the other one first, take care of the other, but there was this whole environment in my family, this whole culture that was supported in that you think things through, you're, you know, we, we, we kind of had a, you could tell that my parents sort of had a, a budget that they operated with, and despite the fact that um, money, the spending of money would be difficult, especially if it was spending on, on us, but my parents were very generous, and so you could tell that there was a budget for giving, and there could be spontaneity in that, but there was, you know, it was always kept within the budget, so there was, you want to be sort of logical, you want to think things through, you want to be generous, you can see there's all these things, and when someone after, you know, six months goes out and spends millions of dollars on a home, you know, I'm like, oh, no. So you see, there's a part of me that I just can't accept. Can't accept that, gee, there are things that I'd like to have in my lifetime that, that don't make any sense, like a house on a lake in Colorado. Or the other piece is uh, I can't let myself, you should see me go through major decisions. It's, it, particularly a few years ago before this whole house thing happened in Grand Lake, I had to evaluate everything, right? It, I couldn't just do it spontaneously. I couldn't spend outside of the you know, general budget that I live in because it, it wasn't valued. Again, you can imagine how if spirit has tremendous ideas for you, ideas of, and they can be just little things, but if they're outside of what you accept about yourself, and you're not willing to look at this process of, huh, why won't I let myself do it? Why, when others do it, do I become judgmental and frustrated? Even if it's just subtle, guys, because I'm not like raging angry that some stranger, I, I'm just frustrated with it, frustrated with our, even our, what human beings do. 
It means that there's something I can't allow myself to do because I can't accept that that could be me too. I love now, you know, I, I work with a lot of people and they'll say, well, why don't you just own that you're a bitch or an asshole or whatever? Why don't you just own it? Why do you, why do you have so much defense up against it? So what someone calls you that? Uh, and they can't. That just, you know, and I just love these days. And maybe that's one of your practices this week. Just own it all. Yeah, I'm a mass murderer. Yeah. I drive, I don't adhere to the speed limits. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm not really that lie-abiding all the time. You know, just own it. Just, I mean, it's so freeing just to say, yeah, I'm that. Or I have the potential of being that. Because the truth is, if we are all expressions of the same spirit shining through a soul that has a slightly different texture than the soul next to us, but it's still the same light then the potential of that light is the same potential in us, whether it's good or bad. And the beauty is that we're practicing on opening ourselves up so that the love of spirit is what informs us, not the separation of ego. From that place, you don't have to worry about the fact that you've got the potential to do all sorts of horrible things. Because as you open up more and more, the love of spirit is what informs you. So let's see what's next. Here's what Colin says to kind of summarize a little bit. If you want to know what you dislike about yourself and have likely disowned, that's the key part, and have likely disowned, simply look at what annoys you about the people that come into your life. Boy, put that on a post-it. Remember, I mean, you know, when you're, when you're fuming about what somebody else has done, what a wonderful opportunity. And he goes on to say, you could be thankful for those people. It feels like the other person is doing something to you to make you angry. However, when you own that your feelings begin with you, not them, you will drop the need to feel victimized and realize that the person is doing these things not to you, but for you. Not to you but for you, enabling you to take back the projection and love it in yourself. So, this week, I invite you to have some fun. I mean, it's important to have a little bit of fun with this, but start looking at who drives you nuts. Are you in a relationship? <laughs> start there. What a wonderful opportunity. You know, for years I bemoaned the fact I just haven't had a long-term relationship. Well, I'm in one now. Mercy. I've never had so much self-reflection, and I try to thank Stuart on a pretty much daily basis, but some days it's much easier than others. We are all big projectors. We don't want to look at it. So have some fun with it. Be lighthearted about it. And particularly be looking at where you both have, and it doesn't have to be a lot, judgment and some level of anger. We're angry. Stop mirroring this back to me. I don't want to see this in myself. We're angry at them for holding the mirror up to us. It'll be a great exercise. And if you're getting really bogged down in it, stop for a while. Remember, spiritual work is intended to bring that which is unconscious, conscious. And once we see it, it becomes so much easier. Like right now, if someone said to me, oh, Scott, you're so self-centered, I think I could say, you're so right. <laughs> you are so right. There are times when I just want it for me. I just want the world to, to revolve around me. Isn't that wonderful? Now, if I lived from that all the time, I wouldn't be very easy to be around, would I? But I don't live from that all the time. And it's important to me to see that. It's important for me to see that sometimes I'm self-centered. Sometimes I'm selfish. Sometimes I'm mean. 
sometimes I'm not the image that my family said I should be. So let's, um, oh, and to remember too, I just wanted to just, moving into the time of meditation, I want you to remember that as we're willing to clear this stuff away, not only do we make room for the pure potential that is ours, but we make room for that sweet whisper of spirit. Just as it whispered to me the word projection to bring me back to a trajectory of healing. Let's move into a time of quiet meditation as we open to that sweet whisper of spirit in each of us. I invite you again to make yourself comfortable. I always think it's important to plant our feet firmly on the ground. Take a nice deep breath. To recognize, I, I often, when I hear a talk like this, my judge gets on me about how in, in, imperfect I am. <laughs> if your judge is all over you, you know, tell it to, uh, why don't you tell it to move to the next room for a, for a while? You don't deserve to be judged for this. This is something that is built into the human mechanism. Something that is with great delight that we get to transcend. Because on the other side is freedom. And so recognize the, the strength in your heart, the support of your belly, the intelligence of your mind. That no matter what the ego convince you of, and it does have quite a strong argument, that there's so much more to you. You are an expression of pure love, bright light. You are the hands and feet that allow spirit to bring things manifest. As we sung about earlier, you are the sanctuary for which spirit plants ideas and lets you run. It is through our willingness to look at our projections, to own the fullness of who we are, the good and the bad, what we judge as the good and the bad. It, we don't even know if it's good and bad. It is through the embracing of the fullness of who we are that we can repeatedly say yes and feel the satisfaction of living a life that is unfolding for us. Unfolding for our joy, unfolding for our sense of fulfillment, enjoying, unfolding for us to experience love. Full and beautiful. And so we rest now for a few moments in the silence, making space for that quiet whisper. Mm -hmm. 